Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Scrubbed In Show. I hope you've all been keeping well. This week we have with us another incredible guest. We have with us Dr. Ben Raftapu, who is the co-founder of Sera, which is an incredible company. And what they're doing is they're Europe's leading and largest digital first home healthcare provider. And prior to that, you've had kind of an incredible career advising the CEO of the NHS. Find out recently you're one of the co-founders of you know the Innovation Accelerator. So you've had an illustrious career doing incredible things with Sarah, but we want to kind of take it back, hear the story, unpick it all. But an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today, Ben. How are you? I'm well. I'm great. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. And um, I've listened to some of your podcasts and it's awesome to see you going from strength to strength with so many other listeners and followers as well. No, thank you so much, man. It it means a lot. Um, And we want to take it right back as well to the very beginning let's say young Ben, you know, a budding clinician. Tell us a bit more about your, your motivations to study medicine, to kind of pursue a career in, in medicine. Yeah, so when I was a teenager, I was interested in business, actually, and economics. And then I was interested in science. That's where it started. And did a work experience placement at a hospital in London on a cardiology department and with a, with a junior doctor. So it wasn't anything illustrious it was a dgh and um, um, and it was a bit run down but i found it amazing to see how you could completely change a person's life oh, wow. uh, within hours or days because th- there was um on the cardiology department people were coming with heart attacks um very high blood pressure related issues heart failure and being able to treat that so fast and seeing just the look on their faces, the look on their families' faces, the amazement, the wonder, the peace of mind that you give them, that was just incredible. And so I always knew that I wanted to do something that would be impact related. I knew that I wanted to do something that would take science and apply it in the real world. And having spent that time, just a couple of weeks in um, it, on a hospital ward uh, and following a junior doctor, which again is not the most exciting role in mm-hmm. Uh, it was an F1 or house officer, as they called it back then. Um, not the most exciting role in a in a hospital. I still thought that was awesome, um, but I I still had a bit of a tension between this interest in business and entrepreneurship and medicine, and that was a tension that would follow me throughout the rest of my career. Mm. So even I, I I applied to do medicine because of that passion for science, of that passion to make an impact. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking, should I be instead doing economics? And in my second year of medical school, even then, I interned at a consulting firm. I interned at an investment bank. This is not really that normal for a medic, at least back in 2008 when I was doing this. Yeah. And it was also the year of the economic crisis. Huh. So I was yeah. working in Canary Wharf and I could see people leaving Lehman Brothers um, as the bank collapsed and as all, the whole crisis hit. And sadly, people were losing your jobs. And that that told me... In, showed me I didn't want to go into banking, okay. and, but I still wanted to think of a way to combine business and medicine. And it, that was a theme that I picked up on in subsequent years of my medical career. No, that's incredible. And I think to have the foresight and to be able to kind of do that internship while being a medical student back then, because a lot of the people back then when I met school, it was just heads down, get through the books, get involved in a few societies, become a consultant as soon as possible. And to be fair, even years later when we went into med school it was kind of similar compared to what medical students are doing now tell us kind of getting through medical school practicing as a, as a junior doctor clinician and what we're interested in here is when does the pivot happen when do you start kind of going beyond the realm of medicine and doing like a, a job outside of it yeah so actually even in medical school i tried to be a bit entrepreneurial by setting up small societies mm. charities here and there and that would combine my um, ambition and taste for making a difference through medicine and healthcare with building something. It was then when I went to the US and I studied there in between uh, my final year and uh, second last year of medical school that I caught the entrepreneurial technology bug. Yeah. Because I was on the East Coast and uh, on the East Coast, everyone is building a company. It doesn't matter if you're a student in your dorm room, which is how Facebook and Microsoft (laughs) are set up, two of the biggest technology companies in the world. It doesn't matter if you're a uh, academic researcher or a nurse or a doctor. 
everyone has some kind of startup or venture they're working on. And what was also really interesting back then when I was studying in the US was that um, technology was taking off. Not just technology used on a computer, but technology that actually impacts our real world. Whether we can order an Uber or whether you can use Tinder for dating. Right back then, these were just mm. brand new names. Oh, has everyone heard of this app? You can use it for dating. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's just, it was you know, hot off the press, brand new. Um, and it was, it became increasingly clear that technology was going to dramatically change the way we go about our day to day. It wasn't just going to be something where you, you go on your laptop and maybe you send some emails, maybe you order some books online. That's it. It was actually going to completely change the way our day to day, our communication, the way we manage our lives, the way we link with other people, all of that would transform. And so I started thinking about how it could be applied to healthcare. And I knew that mm. it may take longer because in healthcare, we're dealing with people's lives. It's regulated, it's more complicated, but I really believe that eventually, right, in our lifetimes, technology would change how healthcare was um, being delivered uh, and the role actually of a doctor and a clinician. And so catching that bug combined with the way the trends were taking off, that really motivated me to start looking more in more detail as to how I can get involved with technology and how I can bring that into healthcare. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to actually try and contribute to that movement of technology transforming healthcare rather than just being someone who uses it and benefits from it mm -hmm. in 20 years time. In the same way that if you went back, if you set up Lyft or you set up Amazon or you were involved in setting up Facebook or any of these transformative technology companies, that would have been awesome. Yeah, yeah we all use them, but actually try taking a, a role in a part of building them would be phenomenal from a career perspective. And it would bring together my interest in healthcare and, and making an impact with my interest in business and being an entrepreneur. Hmm. And that's incredible. And I think that's excellent foresight as in like, I'm thinking of how you were back then and compared to how I was at a similar age. And, you know, the level of force that I had nowhere near as yours. How did you kind of scratch that itch then coming back to the UK? Thank you for coming back. A lot of, you know, clinicians go to America and they never come back. So thank you, you know, for coming back. But how did you scratch that itch kind of being in this environment? And the UK is very different in, in a sense when it comes to tech and healthcare. And by the way, I mean, I didn't see the trend myself. It was more that the people around me were saying, hey, why aren't you looking at this in healthcare? Okay. Or um, I mean, I, my neighbor actually, where I was living, my neighbor, he was an investor for a fund that invests in early stage technology companies. And um, yeah, he got me looking at different things that he was working on, different deals. And that got me more interested. And he would challenge me and say, well, why don't you build a company? Why don't you do mm -hmm. this? And having that challenge and that question put in my mind early on in my medical career, I think was really important. Um, yeah. And I think that's why it's helpful to surround yourself with other people who are trying to push the boundaries, other people who are from different sectors even. Maybe they are software engineers, machine learning engineers. Maybe they work in fintech, whichever. Mm. But those different ideas, especially from sectors that are further ahead in the journey in technology transformation, um, they will push you to think, hey, why can't we do that? Or yeah. Um, what, what if that itch actually became a company? So then um, to, your, to your question about how, when I came back to the UK, I actually tried to convert it into something. Um, I mean, I had to try a lot of different things. I got involved with small projects where uh, someone else was trying to build a startup or someone was building an organization that connected startups with clinicians that were interested in it. Um, and some of those didn't work. But the point <laughs> is, it meant that I tried it, I learned, I build up, I built up my network um, of like-minded people, um, which inevitably would come in really handy when I developed Sarah. Um, and then I saw a role actually that came up for uh, advertisement, which was working with the CEO of the NHS uh, at that point, Simon Stevens, where he was looking for clinicians to bring more frontline experience to what he was doing, as it's really easy to be locked up in that ivory tower of yeah senior parts of the NHS and not really have a firm grasp as to what's happening on the front line day to day. And so I applied for that. I was fortunate to get it. And mm -hmm. my main focus really was in technology and innovation because that had already been a natural um, passion of mine. And 
I wanted to, given it was still a relatively early stage for the NHS in using technology and innovation, I wanted to try and focus as much of my efforts there to try and build some inroads to try and get some traction. No, definitely. One question for you, it seemed like an obvious choice and you saw an opportunity you applied for it. And I know a lot of clinicians speaking to them, becoming an advisor to the seat of the NHS seems daunting. It seems like a very intimidating, lofty role. What mindset did you have? Was it, do you know, I've got the skill set, I'm going to go for it. Or did you have to kind of mentally work yourself up and be like, this is a great opportunity. This kind of allows my career progression or it allows me to kind of do what I want to do in the future. I thought it was a great opportunity, one that doesn't come up too often, but there are now more established programs that allow clinicians to have fellowships mm. with senior leaders across the NHS. Um, but back then, I think it was less common. I also thought that while I was enjoying clinical practice, I knew I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. I wanted to build something or create a company or embrace innovation technology in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. And this seemed to be a, a relatively safe route to doing it, as opposed to jumping from full-time clinician to full-time entrepreneur, which can be a bit yeah. of a leap. This was a safe in-between for me to try something different. So that was the other reason. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're starting to see that trend where clinicians are kind of doing his interim roles, learning more about the space, strategy consultants, there's a lot of roles that people did before kind of going and founding kind of the, the, the health tech they want to do. I want to ask a quick question. How has the landscape changed in terms of technology? Because you started this, uh, this journey in a time when I feel like there was a lot more friction with technology. Whereas now is obviously we're seeing a boom in all sorts of spheres. When you were doing it, what was it actually like? Back then, technology was seen as a nice to have rather than a must have. I think in this day and age, post COVID as well, everyone realizes that technology is a critical part of almost every sector and how mm -hmm. healthcare needs to be delivered going forward. The pandemic changed people's minds because you had to have remote working, remote communication, an app that logs whether um, you've been near someone who's got COVID, where you log your travel passes, where you track your own symptoms. It just changed people's perspective of what technology could do and it forced them to adopt technology in ways that they hadn't had to. That was probably the biggest driver, I feel, in increasing technology adoption. The second would be that as time goes on, technology is moving faster and faster. Yeah. A year ago, people would think of AI maybe as a bit of hype more than reality. Now, everyone's talking about AI and not just AI, the risk of AI surpassing human intelligence, <laughs> right? So it's completely different to just a year ago. And yeah. the main uh, driver and enabler of that has been OpenAI with their product ChatGPT. And that has made complex, sophisticated artificial intelligence accessible to hundreds of millions of people around the world for free, which was never possible before. Mm. And it's turned whole concept of how we liaise with AI, what arguments we need to be having, whether it's even safe, it's turned that on its head. But that's yeah. happened in a year, e. which is extremely fast. And it's only going to accelerate further and further. So my second key point is that technology has been accelerating. And what would have been maybe taken three years of development back in 2015, now will probably take three to six months. It's a yeah. fast world. The mm. final piece that I think has contributed to the world changing is that the value of technology in healthcare has become much clearer. If you talk to health system leaders, if you talk to people who run big um, healthcare providers in other countries or health insurance companies, they are all aware of how powerful technology is. They all recognize that they have to adopt it. It's a key part of their strategy. They can't miss it out. All of them are aware. That wasn't the case a handful of years ago. And even what the big, on, in January of this year, Rishi Sunak made an announcement and one of his biggest announcements around the NHS was increasing the number of virtual ward beds by yeah. five volt in 2023. Yeah. Virtual wards, of course, is a technology-based solution. He wasn't talking about more hospitals, more GPs. He was talking about more virtual ward beds. That's how critical and front of mind technology has become compared to where it used to be. And so when you pull that together, it is a very different world now than it was before. And that means the ability to set up a health technology company, to get off the ground, 
to get people to look at it and think, you know, this is a great solution. We should try it. It's a clearer path to success, in my opinion. And, and to follow that up, uh, Ben, now, right? So now technology getting a bit too saturated for new founders now. So saying that, saying you can pop up with an idea, a startup, wherever I look now in the healthcare, digital health space, I see any idea that I potentially sit down and think of, it's there, someone's doing it. Is there room in the market if the technology is like, it, it's so advanced, it's so much quicker, adoption is there. Um, is there any room left for new founders? So health tech is definitely heating up. It's more busy than it used to be. But if you compare it to fintech or e-commerce, we still got a long way to go. It's mm. not as busy a space as fintech technology is in Europe and hasn't attracted as much funding from what I've seen. Mm. So I think there is more room to grow. The market is also massive. I mean, this country spends 150 billion pounds plus yeah. on healthcare a year. If you look at that in terms of other countries and on a European basis, so market is massive. It's bigger than almost any other market uh, in any respective country in Europe. Therefore, there is a lot more room to expand. I think competition sometimes is good. It forces us to build better quality products and it also raises awareness, right? Mm -hmm. The market mm -hmm. adapts. Uh, people purchasing healthcare products, suddenly, because there are three different telemedicine apps they can use, they realize, okay, telemedicine is something I should probably do because all three of these companies are advertising, which mm. is the best product for me. Kind of going back to the point I wanted to make, um, definitely post-COVID, the, the the landscape has become definitely more receptive. The you know the, 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 the population expects more technology-enabled services, digitalization of the NHS to a certain degree. That kind of leads me to, Sarah, what you're doing and the kind of the rapid growth. You know, loads of articles saying, you know, how incredible it is, you know, hundreds of millions of fundraising, millions of visits annually. Tell us about the zero to one, the early, early days. Like that is, you know, what we want to really get into because I think there's a lot of value there that we kind of skip over when you look at a big company so far. Yeah, and zero to one was, I mean, it was tough. <laughs> It's still, even now, I mean, yes, it's, we're larger than we used to be, um, but with that comes a different set of challenges that we have to overcome, and I can talk about that. But in terms of zero to one, I mean, I'd spend time um, at, at a national level focusing on policy. I'd also gone back to practice clinical medicine. I knew I wanted to build a company. I'd kind of reached that conviction because my role in the NHS looked at how startups and bigger technology companies can um, spread and be rolled out across the health service and that also I saw in my role in the NHS Innovation Accelerator. I knew that not only did I have the itch or the bug to set something up, I thought it was possible, I thought now was the right time and I thought I should do it because I was in my 20s, I was in my late 20s then and I thought it's also a good time to take a risk. The longer you leave it, I personally feel the harder it is to take a risk okay. because you've got more commitments from a personal perspective you're more you're deeper in the nhs in terms of your training maybe your registrar or consultant or further along all of that means it can be harder to uproot yourself and then jump into another line of work whereas if you do it early um, if it doesn't work out you can always go back to your training right or you can take an, a year out or an opt or, or whichever program or you can take a break in between f2 and your core training or your core training and your specialist training, there are lots of breaks that naturally emerge, which is what makes it a great time to try something different. And so all of those reasons meant I want to, wanted to build a company. The question was where? And mm. it was the combination of, this is back in January 2016, of organizing care for my mum. So she fell, she fractured her back. It was really difficult for our family and she needed care in the home. But it was a nightmare to try and get that care sorted and organized. Um, we, I ended up calling up different home care agencies. They weren't available. So my sister Anne and I ended up caring for my mother ourselves, um, which when you were back then, I was uh, in, I think I was an F2 in general practice or something. It, it just stretches you, right? Yeah. You got your day job. And then in the evenings, you have to look after your loved one. They lit in my mom and then was living in North London, different to where I was living. So it was just a lot to take on in parallel. 
Um, and then eventually we had a carer who did come in and start looking after her, but I wouldn't know when the care was arriving or if there are any issues. It wasn't like, I don't know, delivery or Amazon where you've got all of the updates on your smartphone mm -hmm. and you get that real time peace of mind and insight. It was very different. And I thought that this is, this seems just a bit broken. It doesn't seem like it's a great setup. Technology can help. And also the people are really well intentioned. They want to deliver a great service. But because the organizations they work in, this is social care, this is care in the home, are just so backwards using pen and paper, they can't, it's hard to do a good job. So that was mm. one line of thinking that happened early in 2016. The other was, I just kind of took a bit of a blank canvas. I said, where would I want to set up a company? It'd probably be an area where there's a lot of demand. There's growing demand over time. Ideally, um, technology can make an impact because it's proven that technology can be beneficial in similar industries elsewhere. It's ideally set up with businesses already in the space who are being used by the NHS or by councils for services. That means from a business model point of view, it's just easier. They've mm -hmm. proven that out that you can get paid to do this. Um, and then maybe looking at other countries, there would be benchmarks or comparables. Um, mm -hmm. So in the US usually, because the US, when it comes to venture capital backed or investor backed fast growth companies, it tends to be a bit further along the curve than in Europe. And those are some of the different criteria I had. And based on that, I've landed on, okay, well, care in the home or healthcare in the home seems like a good space because more and more healthcare is going to go in that direction. It's more convenient, cheaper results and better outcomes. Healthcare in the home in this UK is delivered almost entirely by small businesses. They're very backwards. They don't use tech. So technology can probably help. And if you look at a lot of other businesses that focus on logistics, what Amazon has done for retail and books, what Deliveroo has done for food delivery, what Uber and Lyft have done for ride sharing, people have used technology to improve the experience, to improve the logistics, the matching of um, supply and demand. It could maybe be helpful in the sector. And so by applying that that data and that those different criteria, I landed on a very similar place to where I was passionate personally, given my experience with my mother. And then I started thinking about the best way to set up the company. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I actually put out a couple of feelers to some of my friends who are more in the tech space and they connected me to, um, Marek, who would then become my co-founder. Nice. He was from a very different background and we can talk about what type of backgrounds complement clinicians in a bit when you're building a founding team. He, but he was from a very complementary background. He'd built a couple of startups in the past. He was a software engineer by background. And after I had a couple of copies with him, I thought, actually, I can work pretty well with this guy. Let's try and set something up. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. the, the, you answered the question. It was, you had a passion, you had a real need that you personally faced, but you then went on and kind of did the research, saw if it was a viable option. I feel a lot of clinicians entering the world, they're very in love with like a passion project with a hobby that may not necessarily be a viable startup that's, you know, maybe VC backable. Tell us advice for those people. Cause I think, you know, sometimes you get caught up in it and you might see something in the theater that's broken and you want to go down this route of creating a medical device that, you know, a different sort of grip or whatever. How do you kind of balance the two? Your passion versus viable business? It's while it may take a long time, I would say you have to get both. You have to have passion. If you don't have passion, you're not going to be motivated. Mm -hmm. When you're working those long nights, when you're going through different challenges, if you're not passionate, you're not going to push through that and make a successful company. At the same time, if it doesn't have strong business fundamentals, fast forward three to five years, even if you do raise some money, you aren't going to have a business that works. Mm -hmm. right? And then you're going to be in a difficult position. So having both, while it may take time to look for, is really important. And... Um, with Sarah, I think uh, what was important was that I did look for where would be where there'd be a good business model. They were already functioning home care businesses in the UK. They didn't use technology, so they didn't operate particularly well. But I thought we can make it better with tech. Yeah, they already function as profitable businesses in the US. There were some startups taking off that had good um, unit economics. They were backed by high-profile investors. All of that gave me a bit more confidence. Mm. And to put into perspective why I think your question is really important, there are over 300,000 apps on the absolute health and wellness. 
only a fraction of them get used widely. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think lots of people do have passion projects. It could be a patient with diabetes who says, you know what, I want to build an app that helps me with my diabetes. But maybe other patients don't find it that valuable, or maybe clinicians don't think it's strong enough for them to be prescribing and giving to other people. That means it doesn't get adopted. And therefore, the fact that there's so many tells you that actually a relatively smaller number get significant traction yeah. and in turn build a business model. Yeah. And you want to look for technology as transformative, but also a great business model, bring those two together. No, I can also a bit about raising money, but we can cover that when you want to. The, the following question to this is, you've got passion. You know that it can turn into a viable VC-backed startup as to like a kind of lifestyle business. When do you know a business is failing or when do you kind of get the telltale signs where, do you know what, we need to give up? We, you know the whole kind of grit, keep at it, do things that don't scale, all of the stuff people read all over the internet, right? At what stage do you like, hey, do you know what, time to move on, time to pivot? I think moving on and pivoting are different. And yeah, so yeah. pivoting, I'm a big supporter of. And in the early stage of a company, you are going to pivot, right? So when an, an investor, a seed investor or series A investor is looking at a company, the number one trait they look for is the team. Mm. Because they know there's going to be ups and downs and the journey is going to go from here to there. It's the team that's going to get through that and make it a success, right? The business plan will change. The strategy, yeah. the customer acquisition, the product will all adapt. It's normal. And if you look at health technology companies at scale, they've gone through all sorts of journeys to get yeah. to where they've got to. So if you make the assumption that, okay, well, I, the current business model may work, it may not, um, then what you're betting on is the team. And that's mm -hmm. why when you're doing the zero to one, the most important focus for a clinician or a junior doctor who wants to get into a health tech company and build one is who are the other people around me, right? If I'm joining one, who else is around the table? How strong are they? Or if I'm setting it from scratch, how am I going to get other people on my founding team who compliment me? I'm a clinician. I understand healthcare really well. I know what patients need. I know how the NHS may work, but maybe I don't know how to build technology myself because I don't write code. I need a great technologist. Maybe mm -hmm. my commercial understanding could be better. So I need a strong finance person or someone who's worked in a commercial role in a startup before. You want to bring those key roles together in your founding team and therefore you'll be much stronger right? The different edges of the company will be stronger and therefore you'll be more successful. You'll be more investable, raise more money. One thing will lead to another. So the team is super important. I think in terms of when to call it a day outright, um, one of the flags are, I would say, on negative unit economics. So unit okay. economic is the cost of getting a customer versus the profit you get from a customer. If you're spending a lot more to get a customer mm -hmm. than the money you're making, Long term, that's not really going to work, right? I mean, yeah. if it costs you a pound to buy an apple and you sell the apple for 50p, that's not a great business. There are some businesses that pour tons of money into having negative unit economics and they keep going. Yeah. At, you need to, at that point, say, okay, the unit economics is not working here. We're probably executing it relatively well. So we've got to pivot. And even at Sera, we had to do that. We started off delivering healthcare in the home through direct to consumer marketing. We did loads of marketing to get customers. What we realized is healthcare is a product that's it's intimate, right? It's a lifetime decision. You think about it really hard. You don't just see an advert and say, I'm going to try that in the same way you would for Just Eat um, or yeah. Group. Therefore, it costs a lot to acquire a customer through marketing and it's slow. And we found that actually the unit economics for us didn't work too well. The amount of money we, it costs to get a customer versus the money we made from them, it wasn't balanced out too well. And then we switched right? Even though our competitors at that point weren't switching, they all kept doing that. We switched in and we completely turned up our marketing. And instead we focused on partnering with the NHS, with local, mm -hmm. local councils, with hospitals, because we felt that that B2B model, that partnership model would result in much better economics for us. And that was the case. I think you'll see this. If you look at health tech companies in general, yeah, many of them go from a direct consumer model where they do advertising to get more customers to more of a B2B partnership model. Mm. No, definitely. And that's the trend I've noticed as well. They all start that customer and they kind of slowly transition into B2B. While talking about B2B, 
how did you manage to secure those first handful of NHS contracts? You know the question, like a lot of tech founders, amazing product, really good marketing. They just fall short of securing a contract. They struggle to get a free pilot, convert it into a paid contract. How do you kind of navigate that space? Yeah, so there are a few things I'd say here. The first is that we try to repackage what we did from a direct to consumer marketing point of view to help us get contracts. Because we delivered care and healthcare in the home to a number of patients who were paying for it themselves, one of the benefits from that, even though the economics weren't great, one of the benefits was we had proven our product. Right? Mm-hmm. We had generated a track record. We had shown that people liked our service and it kept them out of hospital because they were being looked after in the home. Yeah. And we used the numbers from there so that when we applied for a partnership, we were more compelling, we were more successful. Okay. And so when you bid on a contract, having a bit of track record, even if it's through, as you say, a free pilot or direct consumer marketing, that can be helpful. The second point is that we applied for contracts that already existed. Um, going back to what I said where healthcare in the home, there were other businesses doing this. They were just yeah. small and old school. They didn't use any technology, it's pen and paper whiteboards. What that meant was we didn't need to completely create the con- contract system for this from scratch. Hospitals, the NHS, councils, they knew what it was. They knew what care in the home was. They already had contracts up and running to pay for it. So that made it easier for us to slot it. That also reduced some of the friction. The final part is, I mean, we did have to, we did, we did have to do a lot of knocking on doors, right? I mean, yeah. it took a lot of persistence. It, for our first contract, uh, which was in London, South London, we had to try and call them many times, email them. We went to their offices. They were kind of like, why are you here? You don't have a meeting. <laughs> you just have to put in that effort. And eventually, of the 10 or 15 people you're talking to, one will bite, give you that shot. Maybe it's kind of not on the terms that you want, but they'll give you a shot. It allows you to prove yourself, and then you can win more contracts. Mm. No, mm. definitely. And I think, like I said, even the numbers, when you do post from Syria, like, the visits you're doing, the amount of money you're saving the NHS, it's very compelling. And I think perhaps an unfair advantage you had with the company you're building was you could literally slot in, you know, you were a 10x improvement compared to the next company. Question is, how did they respond? How did, you know, the mom pop shops, the existing platforms, or not platforms, that said, companies respond to, you know, Ben with his Sarah, his fancy tech, you know, and gear coming and taking their, their, long you know trusted businesses yeah i think initially there was definitely friction and people didn't know what we were they thought we were kind of an uber model for okay in healthcare they thought that the staff would be self-employed and you know we wouldn't necessarily be regulated by the cqc we were regulated and what happens is when there's a bit of hype or visibility around a company the um, individuals who are already in the sector, who are part of the incumbent, part of the traditional players, they start to come up with their own ideas, their own views. Mm-hmm. So I had to quite early actually talk to the professional association who represents home care and home health care to explain what we're doing, to strain the story, to make sure that they understood. And to also say, look, this is a very large market full of 10,000 plus businesses. You've definitely got room for one more. There's more demand, yeah, plenty of demand to go around. There's an excessive demand actually for for this because of all the challenges in the NHS to get patients discharged from hospital to home. Um, And also long-term, this is where the sector needs to go. The sector does need to use technology. It will make staff's lives better. It will make patients' lives better. And it, it took some work to get them there, but eventually they realized. And what I've found since is that more traditional players adopt their own technology. Right, they don't build it themselves like we do, but they'll get stuff off the shelf. They'll make an effort. They'll try because they realize, you know what, this is the way it's going. We do need to improve. And now that that switch has happened, and also it's post COVID, it's it's pretty straightforward. People don't say, you know, what well, what's Sarah up to? We're we're more established. But in the early days, we did have to push through some bar- boundaries and barriers. Coming back to the early days and kind of scaling it. How have you kind of managed to scale it and culture? How are you kind of looking after the culture, especially when 
a large number of the workforce delivering this care are people outside of the office, their headquarters, right? They are in individuals' homes. So how do you maintain that brand, that culture, um, kind of, you know, what your experience has been with it? The culture is extremely important, particularly in healthcare, which is mainly people-based. I actually mm. think that when I was an NHS doctor, culture was underestimated. Yeah. Right. NHS management at that time didn't really invest in building a culture. Me as a junior doctor, I'd have my rotor, I'd turn up on a Monday, I'd see my team who I'd never met before, it was the first month of the rotation, we'd meet each other and then we'd crack on with it, right? There wasn't mm. really much of a ramp up or an investment technology. The closest thing was the mess parties, yeah. right? And, and, the, and, the, and the doctor's mess where we'd go sit and have lunch, which was great, but it wasn't intentional, right? And it didn't mm. look at the whole organization, it was much more about junior doctors, as opposed to, you know, what about nurses or physios or managers and how do they all kind of come together? Culture is really important. Um, at Sarah, what we've done is it comes down to how we support our carers and our nurses. Uh, when we onboard them, we give them an induction, we give them a lot of training. Um, we continue to train them throughout their journey. So on a quarterly basis, they get different training modules that's both in person and online. Technology in the app helps them tremendously as well because rather than being this lone ranger who goes from house to house to house looking after different patients and having no one in their support network, instead they can liaise with other carers. They can send messages to our operations team. That creates a, a, a virtual community that they otherwise wouldn't have. And I know it's not necessarily always in person, but it's better than what the alternative would be. Plus, yeah. we're now in an age where I think people are more used to having digital support networks, yeah. friends and family who they catch up with online video calls and so on, even if they're in different countries, but that still gives them a bit of a support. Uh, and yeah. we try and do that with our carers. Finally, we do really believe in rewarding them well. So mm -hmm. we try and make sure that they spend more of their time caring rather than traveling, which means they get paid better and they get upskilled to do more complex tasks, things that sometimes nurses would do, which means they get paid better as well. All of that helps to improve the culture for our carers. Mm. I think COVID um, forced us to be even sharper because it wasn't just about our carers and nurses in the field. The whole company was working remotely. Yeah. I mean, because we scaled so fast during COVID, we had to think of ways to still build bonds and cohesion. Um, otherwise, you've got people dotted around the country and even in other countries from all sorts of backgrounds, software engineers to clinicians through to regulatory experts, through to finance people, through to operation, operational staff, jobs around the country, you need them to work properly together. Mm. And so we spent a lot of time trying to improve the culture of remote working, which in turn had a knock-on benefit for how we support our carers and nurses who are working remotely in the field. When scaling, a lot of times you see the founders become the CEO. They get to a point and they're very quickly and swiftly replaced by management that are brought in, you know, so it's raised hundreds of millions. How have you kept yourself in the driving seat? I think, um, yeah, so when that happens, sometimes it's the founder's choice. And I can understand why. You know, being a founder, it's, it's tough, right? It stretches you. Every time the company gets bigger, it's new challenges, it's new problems. Mm -hmm. It's like a new job, right? Imagine if you went from F1 to consultant in two years. <laughs> I mean, that would be pretty difficult and you probably, you'd feel out of your comfort zone, but working in a startup can sometimes be like that. So I can understand why it's not for everyone. And if people want to step back and let someone else come in, that makes, that makes sense. I do personally believe that founder led businesses tend to culturally be more robust and mm -hmm. be more aligned to the future vision of where the business is. And that's why if you look at major technology companies, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Tesla, Google, yeah, all of them have had strong founders who've taken those businesses to much, much larger and this the stock market and taken them beyond that. Um, and they kept that culture and that DNA in the business. Um, I think when it comes to s staying in the driving seat, you've got to keep reflecting on how to grow yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because the training and the learning is quite self-directed. It's a bit like at medical school where you do like PBL or whatever. It's kind of, it, instead of going to lectures, you kind of have to put yourself in the situation and learn and be open to learning in that way. 
um, and kind of grow the different muscles that make you a good founder and CEO. I think uh, in addition to that, having board members who want to grow you, yeah. who want to advise you and mentor you or coaches who will do that um, as part of their advisory role with the company, that's really important. And that goes down to having a supportive board. The next thing I'd say outside of trying to grow yourself is you can't do everything. You're never yeah. going to cover all the bases. So it comes back to the team. And hiring strong team members is one of the most important skills as a founder. It goes back to day zero, where when you're working out who your co-founders are, getting great co-founders is a difference between a successful company and one that sadly doesn't make it, which is why it's so important to investors in the early stages. It's the same. As the company scales, you sometimes need to get stronger leaders for different parts of the business. Maybe it's a technology leader, maybe it's the operation, maybe it's finance. And being very sensitive to that. So you move quickly if you see a gap. And it doesn't mean that that person currently doing their role doesn't need to stay. They can just have a slightly more specialized role. Um, and then you, the rest of it, you give someone else who's new to the company to cover. That's fine. But you always want to be very sensitive to how your team are coping with the pressures and the scale and whether they are growing in line with the business or whether you need to bring in new talent and capability. Founders who don't do that, ultimately, it means that all of the work goes on them. It's hard to keep up. It becomes a downward spiral. And then their board or their investors start asking questions. Mm -hmm. So hiring a great team is the second thing I'd say. I think finally, having investors who are patient, who back you as the founder or you as the team, um, and give you some freedom, that's that's finally, that's the last thing that I'd say is is crucial because I know there's some investors out there that take a very different view and are more active in kind of moving people off positions. Um, I, I think American venture capital firms actually are really founder orientated. Hmm. They can be very founder orientated. They really believe that we're betting on the founder. This is a bet on the entrepreneur or the entrepreneurial team because that's what's been built successful technology companies, such as the ones that I mentioned mm -hmm. before. Um, and that cultural mentality, you want to try and instill early on in the business. Important, you shared kind of both sides of the story, because sometimes you do see it, it does get messy, and you do feel slightly sorry for founders that do get pushed out of the company. They've worked so hard to build, and they lose the autonomy. They lose, you know, the, the vision strategy. Um, no, so thank you for sharing that, um, Ben. On the, on the topic of hiring and how you talked about founders starting to now delegate sort of roles and responsibilities, right? At the zero to one stage, even ourselves, me and Abdul, right? You're, you're doing almost everything, right? And it's because you believe in the dream vision, you're pushing it through, right? But there comes that moment where you need to start offloading some of the tasks. Otherwise, you're never going to keep up. You're never going to move forward. Talk to us a little bit about the process for the founders who are listening in. They're at that that pivotal moment where if they've got so much on their plate and there's a few things like fundraising, for example, I hear that take, that's a full-time job on its own. So like, tell us a little bit about letting go of responsibility and passing it on and trusting your team members. Yeah. I think once you get set past a certain number of employees in the business, you have to delegate. When I co-founded Sarah, I was doing everything as well, right? In terms of cleaning the office, finding the office, um, <laughs> Figuring out whether, you know, doing all of the content for our website, line by line, everything on our editions, just, I, you know, I had to pick up everything and in the, in the early days and that was part of the job, right? That's just part of building a startup and it's fun mm -hmm. in its own way. But I think, yeah, once you start to get more employees and also your role adapts, so yeah, you focus on fundraising, which can take up a lot of time. For the benefit of the business, you have to let other people take over. And that's why you need a good team, mm. but you also have to be self-aware. So in the same way that I mentioned, you've got to be self-aware about what your gaps are and try and grow or find people who will balance out your weaknesses and the areas that you may need to develop more in. It's the same during that phase of when you are having to focus more on fundraising or similar type of objective or deliverable, having that self-awareness of, okay, I think I do have too much on my plate. Mm -hmm. I now need to focus on what I'm good at, give the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. I need to put a process in which allows me to be close to the business without me having to spend huge amounts of time in it. Maybe it's kind of certain reporting measures or dashboard that gives me all of the key metrics yeah. in the company. 
it's mm. a weekly check-in or twice weekly check-in. There are different ways to set that up so that you don't need to be really deep in the company every single day, but you're still close enough to understand that it's going in the right path or if it's not, you can intervene. Mm-hmm. And um, off of the back of that now, what does your day-to-day look like now compared to your zero to one base checking the content on the web landing page? What do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? I do a combination of, one is thinking about our strategy. You know, what next? Fast forward three, six, 12, 24 months for the business. Mm. Two is kind of mainly investment decisions, right? It's normally, should we spend money on A or B or C? Mm -hmm. And it's never a clear cut answer. It's kind of, they're all quite close. They have their pros and cons. We don't have all of the data in the picture now. So we've got Mm -hmm. to make a judgment call, which way we're going to go, right? That's kind of a second key area. Then I tend to be... (laughs) The great thing about having a strong team is they pick up most challenges. The bad thing about having a strong team is that the challenges they can't do, you end up with. (laughs) Which can be... So I'll spend time, I don't know, there's a problem and it needs addressing, then I'll roll up my sleeves and get involved with that. Mm. Hiring. So not just building the team who reports me, but the team underneath them and then even a layer beneath, making sure all of that is as strong as possible. I spend Mm. time there. And I personally enjoy partnerships, deals, fundraising. Um, Those are kind of the areas of business I particularly enjoy. So I I will spend a lot of my time on that as well. Amazing, Mm -hmm. amazing. And um, for the um, high on the hiring point now, right? A lot of clinicians are looking for getting involved, right? When you are sitting in an interview and there's a clinician opposite you, who's got an interest in working for you, working for your company. On this podcast, I want you to give some tips that, some inside information. What are you exactly looking for? I think someone who's hungry, firstly. I think mm-hmm. hunger hunger gets you so far, right? Even if you don't know kind of the part of the company you're working in or you haven't done before, being hungry pushes you through. It takes you that extra mile where the other people in the team just wouldn't go. And so you can mm-hmm. easily compensate for limited experience with hunger and drive. And seeing that and seeing a person's story, the journey that they've had, where they've come from, where they've got to, that hunger and drive um, is mm-hmm. probably the first um, area that I look at. Similar to that, I'll just ask them about a tough problem that they may have solved. Mm-hmm. Because also problem solving. It's, it's, it's important. And it could be in their role as a junior doctor or as a clinician. It could be in another part of what they do. If they've kind of had a side business venture or they're even an academic role or whatever it is or project, a tough problem that they've solved. Mm. And, and then I tend to ask about people's, what people haven't done well, right? <laughs> what their failures have been. Because in, when you're building a company, you fail all the time. And you need the resilience. It goes back to the hunger point. You need the resilience to just keep taking those hits and keep going, pushing through. Mm. Those are some of the characteristics that I tend to look for. I think everything else you can figure out on the job pretty mm. much. Right? If you're hungry, you can solve problems, you're dynamic, resilient, one way or another, you'll get there. And it's a very structured way of seeing it as well. That comes into kind of big question in terms of fundraising, right? You've got an incredible product. You're gaining traction. You want to scale and now you have to kind of pick up this additional full-time role of fundraising. Tell us about your experience at the various stages of the rounds, right? So raising a pre-seed or an angel round is very different to kind of your most recent round. Um, tell us about that and how you managed to get through it. So I think the first couple of times involved a lot of luck and a lot of mistakes, <laughs> um, if I'm honest, because I just I had no business experience. And that is, you just got to knock on a lot of doors. You got to meet a lot of people. You got to call email angels. Um, you got to write to seed funds. You got to go to events where there may be investors. It's all of that stuff. Mm. And just putting in the time, which is why having great co founders who can pick up more operational parts of business is super important. Um, and then, and then for an early stage, the number one factor is yeah, it's the team. 
yeah um which i've mentioned i think the number two factor at, in an earlier stage is the tab the total addressable market right is this a market which can ultimately result in a successful business the way it's set up the size or not the third thing that um i think people tend to look for is technology so you can see these all begin with a t team tam technology uh, is technology going to be beneficial do they have something unique depending on the stage pre pre-seed seed series a series b the maturity of the technology will change and then the final one is traction yeah. how much traction has the business got and the more mature the company the more it moves to the last couple of points i mentioned which is how strong and unique is the technology how much traction does the company have what are the numbers like so for the most recent round in Sarah, it was a lot more about what are Sarah's numbers? How has it progressed? How has it scaled? Can they then scale this further rather than the background of me and my my teammates? Mm. At an early stage, it's a lot more about the team than it is about your traction technology because you probably don't have much given it's a pre-seed round. Mm. And so there's a sliding scale between those factors, but ultimately those are the buckets that I tend to view it in. Tell us about dealing with the pressure that comes when you are dealing with a large chunk of money you know because there are new expectations not only are you trying to grow a company deliver the care build it you know how do you as an individual look after yourself your mental health your well-being yeah and i think three years ago this was never something i even gave a thought to right um but as sarah matured as the pound signs became bigger <laughs> The number of people we were responsible for increased. Yeah. The number of employees we increased. I thought to myself, actually, I've got to make sure that um, I, I'm at the top of my game. I've got a really clear head. I'm making good decisions. And even though there is a lot of pressure and responsibility, I'm handling that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I changed. You know, you read these books or hear about these podcasts where CEOs get up early in the morning, they go for work, <laughs> they do all that. And um, they try and... Uh, yeah, I think Jack Dorsey, who was the CEO of Twitter, used to spend two hours meditating in the morning or something. I think, you know, those are slightly more out there examples, but there's, there's still an element, which is you need to have a balance. You need to have protected time where you're relaxing, where you're with your family and friends, where even though the company is still operating, you're just not getting sucked into that because it's a marathon, right? You need a sustainable rhythm. That rhythm is different for different people but you've got to have a rhythm and mm -hmm. whether it's what you do in the evenings or in the mornings or and whether you have a routine when you exercise how you carve out the weekends how often you take holidays i know some founders who every 12 weeks they go on holiday nice but in exchange for that they'll work saturdays right so there's a bit of a trade-off there uh, but i think you've got to have that slightly more holistic view and I, the more senior you become, the more important it is because it's about judgment, decision making, rather than just rolling up your sleeves and you know sorting out the office, which is what it was back in you know, in the early days, Sarah. Um, and yeah, I you know now even from a, a training point of view, I used to kind of go to the gym and do weights. A few years ago, now I just do cardio because I find that running clears my head a bit more. And from an energy level perspective, it just makes me feel better uh, for the rest of my day and for the work that I do. It's different for different people, but having that sustainable routine, thinking about it from the outset, once you know the company reaches a certain scale, it is important. Yeah, definitely. And I remember reading somewhere Richard Branson all his days around looking after himself so he can make that one or two big decisions. So these big decisions kind of move the needle affect the trajectory and the direction of the of the business to kind of bring it to an end what does the future look like for you for sarah you know if if jeff bezos saw the phone and be like hey ben love what you're doing you know what we're looking to acquire you you know yeah <laughs> tell us what the future looks like i'd say we've still got a lot further to go jeff but thank you <laughs> oh well all right um so we see more and more healthcare going to home. And while we started with carers and nurses, we're moving to other services, medication okay. delivery, tele-nursing, um, virtual wards, because we think that's all part of one ecosystem and we want to create and deliver that ecosystem. 
And while we started with older people, we're now moving into other demographics. We need mm -hmm. healthcare as well. We provide care to people with physical learning disabilities, chronic conditions, but we're also just going to look at younger people more generally. Yeah. And then finally, we want to expand in terms of geography. So yes, okay. we have the UK and Germany, but I suspect fast forward a couple of years, we will be in at least one other international territory. Um, the final piece is that because Sarah now has a, a decent amount of scale and a lot of that scale is on technology, mm -hmm. it means that we're collecting a lot of data of patients in their home. And that data is quite difficult to come by otherwise because these people don't, they don't use a Fitbit, right? Mm -hmm. If they're 90 with dementia, they're not going to use their smartphone app to track their conditions. We collect that information, which places us in a strong position to understand how they're doing and to build products. And so while AI a year ago was hype, and that's definitely what I felt it was, even though there was progress, we're in a completely different world that, and we want to start really making the most of the data we have to build AI based products yeah. that allow us to deliver a much better service. And I think mm -hmm. the more Sarah invests in that, the more we can position ourselves as the pioneer for doing it, at least in healthcare, home healthcare over the coming years. I love the AI stuff. Even today I read an article that comes of like AI at home trying to kind of anticipate COPD exacerbations and hospital admissions and kind of bringing in the right people, the rescue packs to kind of prevent that. In terms of naturally when people see people doing well, they then get the idea of, hey, do you know what? Ben's doing well, Sil's doing well. I'm going to start spinning off my own stuff. So I'm going to go into the digital health game. How are you kind of cutting through the noise? You know, what's your unfair advantage? What are you need to kind of stay leaders of this pack and trailblazers? So I think for Sarah, because we now have a strong track record of delivering services with the NHS and with councils, it just may, means that there's a virtuous cycle. We win even more contracts, nice. which means we deliver more services, which means we have more scale, which means we have more data. And I, I'm continuing to see that cycle go faster and faster. Mm -hmm. So our win rate for new contracts is around 85%. Our renewal rate is 100%. So while... In the early days, I had to go knocking on many, many doors and even turn up at people's offices when they weren't expecting me. Now it's become much easier. And yeah. the scale is enabling more scale. And that is kind of an advantage in its own way. The fact that we uniquely collect this data set, and I don't think many people do, that's probably another advantage in terms of where we want to get to with AI. No, definitely. I think it's incredible. You've, you've definitely had an incredible journey, Ben. And I feel like you're just beginning do you know what I mean? You're, you're just about to start. And I'm I'm glad we finally got to get this podcast recording, kind of hear you. And you can tell you're passionate about what you're doing, what you're trying to build and what you're trying to do. Um, but no, thank you so much for taking the time out to share your story um, and the incredible work you do, Sarah. Thanks for having me. It's been great to be here. Nice. Thank you so much.